So um, I'm going to talk to you today about our Innovation Institute. I'm going to talk to you about my background and some of the work that I've done and some of the things that we see that are happening and how we compare to the rest of the world that really define some of the work that we need to do. So over the last 23 years, I've spent time as a, a uh, physician advisor, as a technology innovator in the physician space. I've installed computer systems for large doctor groups, for small physician groups. I then worked for Pricewaterhouse for seven years and traveled the country and saw over 23 different hospitals and how they operated and how they needed to watch the bottom line and make things better. I then decided to get off the road. You know, my wife was very happy about that and spent a lot of time in hospitals in New Jersey. I worked as a, a liaison to the IT department to help physicians understand what are the things that were important to them because remember, without a doctor, a hospital can't operate. All of those admissions mean revenue. It still is a business that needs to operate. I then became a CIO of a hospital and ultimately got the opportunity to run one myself, which really gave me a perspective of how technology, business, and clinical needs need to tie together to be able to build a backbone that can sustain any changes that happen in that environment. After that, I decided to work for a while for a, uh, an IT vendor that moved that data, right? Moved clinical data from one hospital to the next, provided it to the next level of care that needed it, and also find, find ways to be able to get grant funding to do a lot of this work, which leads me back to where I am here. You know, I started working on grants at NJIT six years ago, and... Um, we're able to get a $23 million grant to get a network of providers on an electronic system. We were able to transform those practices to now make them eligible for funding from the federal government. And, and a lot of those things are important because we're having a healthcare crisis that needs data, as the previous speaker said, to be able to make actionable changes. Right? If you look at those statistics, we spend two and a half times more than the rest of the world on our health care. You know, it was $147 per, per, per patient at one point to sustain that life, and now it's over 8,000. 17 percent of our gross domestic product is spent on health care. It, it's a big problem, and it needs to be addressed, and the government is spending quite a bit of money on doing so. If you look at these, these uh, world maps, they're, they're sort of like a heat map where it determines the most efficient locations around the world. And the lighter color blue shows that the United States is in that lower percentage of efficient countries. So we're expensive, we don't provide quality care, and we're not efficient. All, all recipes for disaster when you think about how much this stuff costs. So a deeper look allows us to see that, you know, our rankings as a country when it comes to overall quality scores puts us in the middle or the bottom percentile as we compare to the rest of the world and makes us the most expensive country in the world to, to provide health care for. So we've had experience with this, and many of these acts, as you see them come up, we're familiar with the Medicare Medicaid Act of 1965, the Hill Burton Act, the prescription drug reform, which provided medication to all senior citizens, and most importantly, the one that I'll focus on tonight the most is the 2010 Pat uh, Patient Protection and Affordability Care Act. That really drove a lot of change nationally that we're all familiar with. You know, more patients have insurance than they had before. Medicaid has been expanded. We have patients in Newark that don't have a home address but have insurance, and the insurance companies spend a lot of time trying to find them to make them better because if you make them better, those costs go down. Also around that time frame, the High Tech Act was enabled as part of the, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act where physicians were incented to 
adopt electronic health records. And in 2008, as the picture on the left shows, 42% of those, of those uh, physicians had some kind of electronic meeting. And I'm sure when many of you go to the doctor today, you'll notice that there's a doc who's working on an electronic record and trying to get you charted in their office. I'd say that today it's more like 90% or 85%. E-prescriptions was crawling in this electronic transformation. E-prescription was provided to doctors before 2008 as part of legislation, but it wasn't really adopted yet. Not until 2013 did you really see the growth in it because there were penalties for not participating or incentives for doing so. Hospital electronic health record adoption as well. In 2011, there were hardly any hospitals in the country, and we have around 6,700 hospitals nationally. And as you can see, over 95% of those hospitals today have some kind of electronic health record. So now let's look at Newark as, as a microcosm of all these things going on. You know, when you look at these categories, and the last time that we were scored against these categories, in 2009, we were ranked 23rd nationally, where now we're ranked 13th. Sorry, 15th, I can't see it from here. So, significant improvement, but yet not, good and not yet good enough to, to meet the other, the other uh, states around the country. These five indicators show that we are at the, the lower percentages of our state in terms of being able to do these things. Hospital admissions for pediatric asthma, hospitalized patients and information about what they're recovering at home, and readmissions. Readmissions are a really big problem, and I'll explain a little bit more in a bit. For a readmission is when a patient has a procedure such as a hip replacement. That patient goes home, his instructions aren't appropriately delivered to him, maybe he goes home, he should have went to a rehab institute, and what happens is they end up back in the hospital. Well, now hospitals get penalized for those readmissions, and we are the worst in the country when it comes to readmissions. Our hospitals get penalized more than anybody else. So the top five medical conditions that are responsible for a readmission are heart attack, heart failure, pneumonia, chronic lung issues, and as I mentioned before, knee and hip replacements. What causes these, these readmissions, right? Poor communication. These entities don't have the ability to talk to one another efficiently in an electronic way, in an automated way, to make sure that the patients are well taken care of, which results in them ending back in the emergency room. When we talk about medications, patients routinely can't afford their medication, so they take half as much. Well, if your condition or your disease requires you to take two pills for your diabetic condition a day, and you refill it on the 60th day, you haven't been taking the regimen of medications, which results in problems when you end up back in the hospital. In addition, physicians don't communicate with themselves, you know, uh, because there's so many other things that are going on. A doctor, a patient gets discharged as, after having some kind of heart procedure. He gets transferred to a cardiologist. That cardiologist doesn't respond to the surgeon. Next thing you know, that patient's in the emergency room with some kind of infection or problem. Communication is the key to get this work done and also for the patient not to have questions about what needs to happen and what they're trying to do. So how do we solve these problems? How do we get to the point where these readmissions can be managed appropriately and not become a problem for future generations, right? We talked about that... Uh, the organizations were going to start collecting information, hospitals, doctor's offices. Now we have analytics to be able to drive where that patient should go. So we need to be mindful of that and also make sure that our patients have a good idea of what they're expected to do. Where do they need to go? How do they need to get there? A patient goes to the hospital and walks out with a series of documents and instructions that many times they don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. So it's, it's very important that they are well-educated, 
and know that this summary of care documentation that they provide needs to go to the next level of care. Taking care of my father was very difficult at the end of life because his paperwork was all over the place. He had cardiologists, he had specialists, and everybody's information needed to be collected and sent to the right place. So you would get in the car with all your paperwork, end up at that doctor's office, and try to talk to them about what your findings were, trying to navigate the system that comes with being in a hospital as an admitted patient. So a doctor then picks up that information that he's received from you, and he compares it to his note in your office. And then he tries to compare and contrast, reconcile medications, figure out if any meds were given to you in the hospital that shouldn't have been given to you. Meds that are given to you in the hospital sometimes are different than those that are given to you in the house. They're different dosages. They're administered differently. So it's important that that, that transition happen in an electronic way whenever possible. So when you think about the four phases that we just described, your patient goes through the acute phase, the stabilization phase, the maintenance phase, and then the wellness phase. So what kind of innovations are we putting in place to try to solve that problem? We have all of the hospitals lined up now electronically, and we're able to centrally distribute that information. Then we use analytics to figure out where that patient needs to go, if it's a PCP, if it's a specialist, if it's the right level of care, and we submit that electronic package to those docs. So now when the patient arrives, it is in much better, much better uh, place to be able to move forward. So now if we were to take it a little, a little further, right? We we're working with a transportation company because in Newark, moving around is very difficult. So a patient who can't get to their doctor's appointment and get his medications adjusted could end up back in the emergency room and in another readmission resulting in that expense. So if we were able to integrate transportation for a patient to be able to go to their PCP, their doctor, one of the companies, that, the startups that we're working with at the Innovation Institute has come up with the concept, to be able to go to the pharmacy. If you need a wheelchair-bound car, that can also be picked up to you. So, sort of like Uber for healthcare is what we're working on, and all of the organizations in Newark are very interested in, in this process. We're also using that same concept to figure out how to deploy a nurse to the appropriate patient that's needed, right? So if you have a community health worker that needs to go visit a patient in their home, if we have geolocation on where they are, we can make sure that we maximize their time and their schedules and make sure that they go to the appropriate location as we move forward. It's, a, it's an innovative approach. It's, it's sort of Uber on reverse where we know where the, the nurses are and we send them to the right places. That ties nice into our uh, mapping software that allows us to do hot spotting to figure out where those nurses need to be to be the most effective. And this will help us make sure that we take care of those hot spots in the city where we may have patients who are diabetics, asthmatics because of something that's going on, pandemic problems. It's really something that we're looking forward to expanding as we move forward. And ultimately, ultimately, our hope is to have that patient-centered record where you have the power and the authority to submit that information to whoever needs it where you are able to keep it on your wristwatch, keep it on your smartphone, go to that doctor and go to them with the information that you've received about yourself, not only that the information that they've been able to receive as part of those connections. Many of those smart city initiatives also work well in this. Being able to connect and incent or alert a patient or a provider of where they need to go next is something that we're very excited about building Today we were just, well, this week we were awarded a $50 million grant to help transform the practices in New Jersey, and we look forward to putting this all together and doing something great for the city and the state. Thank you.